They serve us in some way, and that's why we keep them around. They have a moral to teach us. We know how to listen. Sometimes monsters get down into the deepest, darkest cracks that our parents and even our religions are afraid to tread. But are they really just stories? We know countless people that would swear on a stack of Bibles that they've seen some sort of apparition or creature that they just have no other word for it except ghost or monster. And we've all had our own experiences that show us there's more to it than just a campfire tale. Speaking of tales, bundle up against the evening's damp chill as you join me here at Chestnut Hill Cemetery in Exeter, Rhode Island. It's long enough to get here. Look down to the cemetery, but I'm not going to stay here long because the area is heavily patrolled. Now turn around, you'll see a white building that is Exeter Baptist Church. It was originally known as Shrub Cemetery, Shrub Hill Cemetery in back. And it was, it is, uh, when this church was more active, it was Exeter Baptist Churchyard. So if you're up for it, I'd like you to take a walk through the cemetery with me. Now, looking yonder, over my right shoulder, you see a stone structure that was common to the old New England cemeteries. This is called a keep, or a holding crypt, and it was a repository for the bodies during the frozen winter, awaiting burial. Now there's a particularly dark story associated with this one, and it involved the family of George and Mary Brown. Here in this mostly rural town of Exeter, Rhode Island, during the last two decades of the 19th century, the family of George and Mary Brown were beset by a strange and swiftly advancing illness. Today we know that illness as tuberculosis. Then it was commonly called consumption or the wasting sickness, even the vampire germ. Being poorly understood and largely untreatable, it was much dreaded. Now we go back and think of the time, the rife superstition. One by one, members of the Brown family would contract the contagion. Mary Brown, George's wife, fell ill in 1883, and she died in December of that year. The next to contract this illness was their daughter, Mary Olive and she died slightly more than six months later in June 1884. Some years later, their son Edwin fell ill in 1890. He started to cough up blood and phlegm, a sure sign of the wasting sickness that took hold of him. Daughter Mercy Lena Brown, who always preferred to be called Lena, fell ill in 1891, and she died on January 17th, 1892, aged 19 years. Prudently, her body was deposited in the holding crypt. And you'll see members of the Brown family are interred in the cemetery all around us. Now, because of the rapidity of these deaths, and they seem centered around the Brown family, friends and neighbors started to murmur that perhaps one of the dead had risen as a vampire, a term they seldom used but knew of. It was even whispered that Mercy Lena Brown was seen visiting her remaining loved ones visible in the moonlight, sitting on their beds. Well, what I'll share with you now 
It's a truly horrific story. It's a true story. It really did occur. George and Mary had lived in that town free of superstition for some time. But now that superstition had seized the entire town. George had to take decisive action. And it was a surrender to, to, to superstition. A solution was conceived, although one born of despair. And it wasn't found in a medical transcript nor an autopsy report, but from their graves! George agreed to have the bodies of his lost loved ones disinterred, <coughs> though he forewent attending the grim affair of the cemetery. His son Edwin at that time was too frail to attend. George agreed to enlist the services of local doctor and county coroner Harold Metcalf. At first, Dr. Metcalf resisted attending and presiding over this affair. But he later relented, since he would be paid and provided with warming libations. <laughs> the surrender to superstition took place on March 17, 1892, precisely two months after the death of Mercy <coughs> Lena Brown. As expected, the bodies of both Mary and her daughter, Mary Olive, had dissolved to bone with lingering traces of putrefaction. Scant strands of molded hair still clung to the exposed craniums. Then, Mercy Lena Brown's body was carried out of the crypt. The lid was noisily pried open. The grave cloth pulled away, revealing the human form underneath. Now present were several villagers, Dr. Metcalf, and a newspaper reporter. Altogether, 12 men presided, and that hour perhaps suggesting an apostolic but decidedly grim jury. Those of the exhumation team who had not held their breaths wished they had. More than one fell to the, to the ground in a faint as a nauseating sweet odor assailed their nostrils. There. Revealed in the diffused morning sunlight lay Mercy Lena Brown. Her eyes frozen open in a visionless stare. Her ruddy lips parted in the appearance of a vague smile. Her hands were curled, her slender fingers like under claws. Her heart and liver still contained liquid blood. Perhaps most unnerving of all these anomalies, her body had shifted to one side. It is said that when her body was moved for examination, from her throat emitted a low moan. The exhumation team, the small assemblage, quickly came to their senses, and decisive action was taken for the immediacy of the moment. Mary's heart and liver were excised, and both those organs burnt on this large stone to ashes. Those ashes were mixed with an elixir and given to Brother Edwin. As an attempted inoculation, the measure did not succeed. Edwin died nearly two months later on May 2nd, 1892. Now today, we know there are, were empirical natural causes for the remarkable condition in which Mercy Lena Brown's body was discovered. The chill of the tomb had preserved her corpse. Natural bloating occurred from the gases within, rendering a lifelike appearance. It is even conjectured that the girl was closed in her casket before she had died. Still in all, there are some elements to the story, as I have told you, which cannot wholly be explained away. Now, uh, this excavation, the last of many perpetrated in the states of Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Vermont during the 18th and 19th centuries, 
became notorious, in part because of its later time. It was the last such exhumation, where bodies were disinterred under suspicion of vampirism. Published accounts of this remarkable story helped to inspire Irish author Bram Stoker's 1897 novel, Dracula. Oh, here comes the patrol car. <laughs>